Good evening, and welcome to Asia Society Southern California's 2020 Annual Gala. My name is Kara Wang, and as always, I am honored that Asia Society has invited me to be your MC for this evening. Now, obviously, we're doing things a little differently this year, but the mission of building bridges between Asia and the West remains the same for Asia Society. In these unprecedented times, the vision of forging genuine understanding across cultures to unlock the potential for a peaceful and sustainable world is more important than ever. I am so delighted to be here this evening with all of you as we honor some very deserving individuals. I wanna say thank you to all of you for joining us, especially our guests from overseas who are battling some very different time zones. One of the positive things that has come out during these trying times is that in some ways, we are more connected than ever before. It's incredible to be hosting this virtual gala, knowing that we have people tuning in from all over the globe. I've been told tonight we have people registered from over 17 countries. That's absolutely extraordinary. We are here this evening to honor some very special people. Our honorees have used their passion, work, and platforms to bring understanding between Asia and the rest of the world. There has never been a more important time where Asian policy, business, and cultural issues are at the forefront of conversation. These honorees have gone above and beyond in changing their communities and the world. The impact that the society has is not only imperative for different communities to understand each other, but also monumentally important as we move forward in the shared future. Here to share a few words is Josette Sheeran, President and CEO of Asia Society. Thank you, Kara. Hi, everyone. I'm Josette, and I'm so glad to gather around with you. As Kara said, it's amazing that in this era of so much change, we're able to come together and to be able to connect with you in this evening of inspiration. Since its founding in the ashes of World War II, Asia Society has built a network of bridge builders, people who are committed, to, no matter how troubled the waters are, to cross over and build bridges of respect and understanding. And we need that more than ever in our world today. And tonight, I'm so proud to be here with Asia Society Southern California for this very important night where we're honoring the game changers, the people who are using their talent, their minds, their hearts, their treasure to build those bridges and build a better world. Tonight, we hope that you'll be touched uh, wherever you are in the world by their stories, by their own commitment, by their own stories of overcoming the odds. We have five visionaries with us, including our global trustee, Stephen Riotti, Stephen, I think you're in Singapore. We're so glad you could be here. And I've seen personally how you've touched so many lives and how our game changers have made a difference and you'll hear their stories tonight. We're also so proud to uh, be here with so many others who are gonna join you for celebrating tonight from Shaquille O'Neal to Ambassador Kono from Tokyo who's come in, who does Middle East peace efforts for Japan. And um, really honored to have Mayor Garcetti here. Mr. Mayor, with all the fires and the challenges in California, I join in really the whole world being so moved by the courage and bravery we've seen in California. And we're just really, really glad to be able to gather with you tonight. So our hope tonight is not only that we'll raise a lot of support for our Los Angeles uh, Center and all the incredible work they do, but that will also lift your spirits. So it will touch you wherever you are and that you'll leave tonight believing that in this time of challenge, those who want to build the bridges are going to pull together. We're gonna to overcome the odds. We're gonna build momentum for a better world and better humanity, a better Los Angeles, and to really benefit all the world. So thank you, Kara. Thank you to our chair, Dick Drobnik of our board, and also to Charlie Coker and the entire Los Angeles team. It's our pleasure and honor to be with you tonight. And I'm gonna sit back and dare to be inspired. Thank you.
Thank you, Josette, for your inspiring words and for all of your work at Asia Society. So I guess we'll just get right to it. We have a video introducing our first honoree of the evening. This honoree is the Chief Executive Officer of Jameson Realty. She is receiving the Urban Visionary Award. This is Jamie Lee. I'm an LA girl. I was born and raised in the Valley and have lived in LA my entire life. But it wasn't until I went to USC that I realized the magic of the city that had always been my hometown. I'm first generation American born, but I'm a third generation Trojan. The legacy of USC in our family is strong and deep. I have three younger brothers and all four of us are double Trojans. Year after year, my love of the Trojan family sustains me. There couldn't be a person that deserves this more. And I mean that from the bottom of my heart. She's one of the greatest developers, certainly in the region, if not the country. And also her involvement in higher education as a fellow trustee with me at the University of Southern California. She's this rare combination of somebody who's creative and smart, who's tough and kind, who is courageous and never shy to make her point of view known and always in the best interest of others. I want to congratulate you, Jamie, for the well-deserved honors bestowed on you this evening. As president of the Los Angeles Board of Harbor Commissioners, you give your time selflessly to ensure that our board and staff effectively carry out the business of America's port. We are also extremely fortunate to have you as a port ambassador to the global base of industries and customers we serve. The 92 riots were pivotal, not only in shaping our identity, but also our business. My parents started investing in Koreatown in the depressed market that followed the destruction of the civil unrest. The last two decades of growth have revolved around the rise and evolution of the Korean American cultural identity in Los Angeles. In the meantime, LA is in a significant housing crisis. In 2013, we opened our first office to residential conversion. Since then, we've developed over 2,000 multifamily units. In 2020 alone, we're opening 1,555 new units and have 2,200 more under construction and 2,000 more in the pipeline. In 2028, the Olympics are coming back to our city. And so I can't wait for my children to see the world come together in LA. I can't wait to see the transformations that will take place and that are already taking place across the city in preparation. We're an LA family and an LA company. It's what we always will be. Jamie, congratulations on being the 2020 Urban Visionary for the Asia Society. And the most important thing, you're just the most wonderful mom and human being and wife that could ever be created. Congratulations. Incredible to see Jamie's journey here in LA and how much of an impact she has had on her home city. Los Angeles is proud to call you one of her own. Here to speak with Jamie on her experiences and dedication to Los Angeles, please welcome a man who was a member of Asia Society's 2006 class of Asia 21, the Asia Pacific's foremost network of young leaders. This is Los Angeles Mayor Eric Garcetti. Well, thank you so much, Kara, and a very good evening to everybody who clearly knows this is much more important than the Lakers or the Emmys. We might be up by four points, but I just heard that from uh, a little birdie. And I'm so excited to be with all of you. And I want to thank uh, Gisette and the entire team here, Charlie, Dick, and the entire board globally on such an incredible organization that I've been so proud to be a part of. Uh, as was mentioned, Asia 21 Young Leaders, the first class that I was a part of, changed my life. And ever since then, whether it's being part of the advisory board here locally, or whether it's giving time, uh, counsel, or seeking advice uh, from this Pacific century that we are building together, Asia Society has been so important for all of us. And so thank you for the honor of being able to interview a great and dear friend, a fellow a Valley native, um, somebody who uh, shares so many of the same interests that I have, whether it's developing cities in the, of the future or whether it's giving back to the community that birthed us both. I'm really excited to have this conversation with you, Jamie. So let's jump in. Um, let me just ask you the first question, um, a simple one. What did it feel like growing up in this city? Um, 
you've had business on this side of the hill and obviously Koreatown has been very important to your family and to the work that you do today, although you're you know, all over the city uh, and beyond in terms of your work, but you grew up in the Valley. What was the Valley like for you and how did that merge with kind of this Asian city called Los Angeles? It was interesting because I grew up in the Valley in a time where there weren't very many Asian people there. It was largely Jewish. All of our neighbors were Jewish. Even um, we had neighbors from Israel, but it was still diverse in the sense that our schools were very diverse. So I, I went to school in the Valley, a little bit on the West side and then high school in the Valley again. And those experiences were able to bring together people from all over Los Angeles, every religion, every race, every family composition. And so I felt like I got a great sense of the world, even being from the San Fernando Valley in the 80s, which I feel like was a very pivotal time for the Valley in kind of getting its identity in and of itself. Well, you know, growing up in Los Angeles is kind of like feeling comfortable everywhere in the world. We're always kind of at home someplace else, as well as seeing diversity swirl around us. What was it like kind of being an outsider and an insider? Uh, clearly, as you said, you know, growing up in a neighborhood where not everybody maybe looked like you, uh, but also being deeply tied to not just here, the Korean American community, uh, but back through your parents to Korea itself and vice versa. How does that kind of inform how you look at the sense of belonging and managing inclusion in a day and age like this? Right. My parents are Korean immigrants who became American doctors. And I think for a lot of people who came in that time, you know, Korean people have been in the U.S. for a very, very long time, but did not have the opportunity to really come in mass, uh, probably until about the late 70s and early 80s. So Korean Americans and Koreans in America are still relatively new in the sense that we're cultivating our identity. We're finding our footing and, and where we belong in this society being in the valley and sort of sticking out like a sore thumb everywhere I went, it was all about assimilation. And I think the primary um, tenets of, you know, Korean immigrants is focusing on education and hard work and sticking with family. So I try to focus on those things um, while trying to assimilate into what we perceived was American culture. Because when you turn on the TV, all you see were white faces or, you know, the one Asian stereotype, whether it was Bruce Lee or, um, Mr. Miyagi, and that was all we really had to go on, was this, you know, sort of striving to be American and to be perceived as American. But growing up, you sort of realize that I can wear suits all I want, I can go to whatever schools I want, but nobody is going to walk up to me and necessarily think that I'm American. I'm still going to have people who approach me in Washington, D.C. and ask me if I speak English. I'm still going to experience, um, you know, racism or prejudice whether it's in my career or, you know, just at a bar or something like that. And as I got older, it was more important to learn to own that, to surround myself with, you know, cultural fluency and to also rely on the sense that all Angelinos have that you talked about, that we're born into this environment where we just appreciate diversity very, very deeply and wanting to get to know each other and more about each other's cultures and to just carry that with me through all of the experiences um, that I've had in LA. So I'm gonna ask you a couple more questions about yourself and then we'll talk about the city. But, um, you know, I, th I think you've been the first in so many places, the first uh, Asian American woman to serve on the Board of Trustees at USC, is that right? That's right. And, you know, you're serving now in so many, wearing so many different hats, whether it's uh, president of the Port Commission, um, you must, uh, have really impressed a, a mayor that's uh, served at some point or another, whether it's on the LA 28 um, committee, which will be bringing the Olympic games back to Los Angeles the summer games for a third time and the Paralympics for the first time. Um, what's excited you and what's exhausted you about being first? The most exciting thing I think to me is when young people come up to me, and I know you're going to laugh at me when I say young people. Well, seriously, when young people, when students, when high schoolers, when people in college and grad school come up to me and say, I, just to be able to have somebody to look up to, just to see somebody who is doing a position that they would secretly aspire to be and not necessarily think that they could be. Because when I look back, I know that there was certainly no one who was Asian American or especially Asian American woman 
who were, was in these sort of aspirational positions that I have. And, and now there certainly are. There are many more people who are in the forefront. So I think that's been the exciting part was the opportunity for mentorship. Um, I mentor a lot of students at USC, um, at my high school alma mater, which we share. And I think that connectivity to be able to see that, you know, I'm just living my day to day life. Um, the recognitions are wonderful. It's great. That's not why I do the work that I do. But to hear from a young person to say that it's actually making a difference in how they perceive the outcome of their lives is very, very meaningful. Um, the exhausting part is, you know, same with racist remarks or things like that. There's a lot of ageism. I hear a lot of stay in your lane. Um, I hear a lot of things that uh, that women um, of all races hear all the time about knowing your place, um, not reaching too high or being too aspirational. Those are things that are exhausting. They should be put to bed. And I think people just need to put their heads down and do their own work and see where they end up. So in your professional capacity, um, for instance, the work that you do unpaid, but very powerfully uh, as the uh, president of the board of port commissioners, you've gone overseas and represented Los Angeles in Asia as an Asian American woman. Um, what kind of uh, feelings do you have going back to maybe the country your parents came from or other Asian countries and being able to represent the face of Los Angeles um, and be an American, be an Angelino, and be able to push that work. And what have you learned from representing LA in Asia? It's funny because there are a lot of stereotypes that American Asians hold about Asians in Asia, particularly in the business sense and how welcoming or accepting they are of women in powerful positions. So I go a little bit guarded when I do go, but I think that either they think it's funny or novel, or they're also proud of it, but they're very welcoming. Um, we've had very, very productive uh, meetings. I feel like I encounter less misogyny in Asia than I do in business in the real commercial real estate industry in downtown LA. <laughs> and so I've been heartened by that. And it's been incredible that they, you know, they take it at face value. I think, you know, I'm also the youngest of many things, um, certainly on, on the city commissions that I've served on and on the board of trustees at USC as well. So I think, you know, I, when I, I did an orientation once and um, somebody who was running it thought that I was a student observer <laughs> and not the person who was being briefed and trained for the position. So I run into that from time to time as well. But to be able to represent Los Angeles, the city that I'm from um, in a foreign country where they, they very much in Korea perceive me as American and I think that a lot of um, my non-Korean friends don't really understand that. They're like, oh, but you look Korean, you should just be Korean when you're in Korea. Um, and they really don't see it that way. They can just tell from you know, my tan or my hair that I'm certainly American, but that I represent um, a piece of them that has sort of left and come back. And so it's been inspiring to be able to do that um, on a business level throughout Asia. Well, let's turn to this uh, Pacific city that I've, you've heard me say is kind of, I think, the eastern capital of the Pacific Rim, Los Angeles, for a minute, and talk about cities. Um, you, uh, your family, obviously have bet big on cities and the urban cores of cities, the often overlooked urban cores a couple decades ago, um, coming out of the unrest of 1992, uh, for instance, a very traumatic moment, as, as it showed in the video. Um, more recently, though, uh, you know, you've moved and built on to commercial and retail investments, the residential work that you're doing now. And yet, boom, suddenly the pandemic hit. And some people are saying, look, in New York, people are moving out and prices are going down. Cities are dead. Retail, this is just accelerating um, what was already happening. What do you see the future of cities? And more specifically, a city like Los Angeles, how do we continue to be economically vibrant, uh, make the investments? And what does the city look like in your eyes uh, when your children are your age? The riots in 92 were interesting because I was fairly young when they were going on. I grew up in the Valley, but my mom and my grandfather and my uncle had their medical and dental practices here in Koreatown. Um, and we certainly, you know, there was a curfew. We couldn't go out. It was very, very, very difficult and scarring time in the psyche of Korean America. Um, 
back then it was very much perceived that law enforcement had drawn a line in the sand essentially at Hancock Park and said, you know, we'll, we'll, stop, we'll let it come up to here. And so, you know, vast scores of Korean immigrant owned businesses were destroyed, buildings were looted, burned down. Um, I didn't think that I would see anything like that again. And we, you know, we call it Saigu 429. Um, we, saw, we commemorate it every year and it's been 28 years. And I remember thinking at the 20th anniversary of Saigu, like how far we've come, so many things have changed, nothing like that could ever happen again. And, and then we see, you know, the civil unrest of this summer. And as that, you know, destruction kind of marched its way down Melrose towards Koreatown, I was gripped by that same fear. And this time we're in a completely different situation as you know sort of an american dream story now possessing a lot of those buildings that had been abandoned in the aftermath of the riots um, now seeing them as our own and this time the the national guard did step in we did have some looting and some destruction but largely unscathed and it just made me realize that so much has changed in many ways but also nothing has really changed either and so there's a lot of work to be done in that arena. The difference this time that I see in the perception of people is the allyship, is this common bond and this sense that um, solidarity across the city, across the nation, the wall of moms, I think is the perfect example of that, is that when we all can come together with this common interest, with this goal, with a very, very universal and simple truth that all lives matter and that black lives matter, that we can continue to create progress in our city. Um, Koreatown has been a great example of that because over the last 20 years, it is one of the densest neighborhoods in the entire country outside of Manhattan, but it's also one of the most diverse. And so it hasn't just been Korean people living here, but every single race um, existing and coexisting here in Koreatown, which like you said, was overlooked for a long period of time. But we're central to the city we're in the middle of every single transportation hub, every single neighborhood surrounding Los Angeles is very accessible. And so it became a very natural story with this Korean American cultural revolution of nightlife, of you know, 24 seven living, of um, being in like dense close quarters and being able to be close to work and close to friends so that you're not spending your whole life in your car. It played out this story where it made a lot of sense to create more housing in this area, which we started to do at the end of 2013. And so we're really seeing that the multifamily piece is building that bridge to where the office and retail um, is really supplementing the entire community. And now we're looking at what master planning we can do to create larger scale amenities that all residents in the area can share, whether it's a massive park or an Olympic sized swimming pool and cabanas and outdoor areas um, for children to play daycare, um, athletics. And so all of that comes into the thought process of not just building a building and filling it up, but also creating a community and creating a sustainable community that people actually want to live in. And I think that plays into what Los Angeles really is, is not an urban center the way Manhattan is or the way the peninsula of San Francisco is but really more of a collection of neighborhoods as opposed to a dense urban city. And that's how people have always felt. And we've actually been getting calls from people who are leaving those other two cities to come here to Los Angeles while they're sort of waiting out the pandemic. We are also seeing people who are leaving LA because they don't have to be back in their offices until you know the top of 2021, but with the promise that they will be back. Because really the, the promise of creativity, of the incredible weather, the workforce diversity here is what drives people to stay in LA and to continue pursuing this LA dream. Um, we have this incredible pent up demand for content creation coming out of the pandemic. Um, I think everybody, we're already starting to see filming requests coming out as people are planning and buying their scripts and movies. Um, and all of the, the tech companies that have come down realizing that people want to be in LA in order to do this work in the entertainment industry. So I feel like this concept that cities are dead or that urban cores are dead, um, that'll cycle back very, very quickly. Because if we're saying that you can't sit in an office anymore with anybody or that you can't be in an apartment building with other people, then we're also saying, 
we'll never go back to concerts or sporting events or conventions. And I think that there is this, um, you know, unbelievable desire of human beings to be back together, whether it is in a conference room with our colleagues or doing all of those entertainment based um, opportunities that LA has. Absolutely. Well, let, let me do a little speed round and then I'm going to wrap up with one last larger question. So Lakers or Clippers? Lakers, come on, seriously. Okay. And did you see the Clippers last week? So don't even get me started. Don't even get me started. All right, they're up 47 36 from what I hear. No, um, you're not supposed to say the score for people who recorded the game. Oh, I mean, that was last game in the second yeah. quarter, if I'm not mistaken. Um, first vacation you want to take if you can travel anywhere in the world post pandemic? My first instinct is to say, I like it here. <laughs> Good. Staycation. This is, so you've, you've had your ideal. Um, yoga or a jog? Yoga. All right. Um, and then with our super one. tatty fun yoga group. What, what's your one wish for Los Angeles? World peace. <laughs> here in LA. Well, so paint a picture on the last question here before we wrap up and congratulations. I, I forgot, by the way, at the beginning of this, we know each other so well. I'm really proud of you. Congratulations. This is an amazing honor. Um, and you do embody the city, our hope, um, Asia society and all that we stand for. So congratulations. But paint us a picture since you're on that committee. I'll be termed out already in 2028. I might have helped win the Olympics, but you know, I'm just going to be sitting there in the audience uh, as a fan with my daughter. What is your hope that Los Angeles represents to the world in 2028 and to this kind of, as I said, Pacific century in the Pacific Rim? Well, it's been sad because it's, you know, arguably one of the darkest times that we're in right now um, with this global health pandemic, with just so much economic hardship that people are facing with, you know, hundreds of thousands of kids who are out of school. And so I keep thinking of LA 2028 as a beacon of hope, sort of the light at the end of the tunnel. And I very much hope that we'll be in Tokyo very, very soon. I, I know that we will be in Paris together soon as well, but I know that we'll be, it'll take some time to come out of the hardships that we're experiencing now. So to me, 2028 is the year where we will be back. We will be, the world will come together here in Los Angeles, not only to just celebrate the incredible achievements of the athletes of the Olympic and Paralympic Games, but also just this, you know, spiritual human communion to really just celebrate in exuberance. I wasn't quite alive yet for the 84 Games. So everyone on the 2028 committee is always talking about and comparing it to the 84 Games. I wasn't quite born, but I was in utero. So I like to feel like I was here <laughs> in LA. I was born that November. Um, but I had heard all these stories that um, a lot of locals left and particularly my friends who were born throughout that year said that their you know, pregnant moms left the city because they thought it would be too hot and too trafficy. And I just can't even imagine um, embodying that place. I can't wait for my children who will be um, 12 and 13 and 10 during the games to be able to see people from all over the world. I mean, they already see it, but to have flown in from all over the world um, to celebrate this with us. And yeah, I think it's going to be a very, very beautiful time. And, and you know, the benefit is we don't have to build any new infrastructure or any new stadiums to do it. We will have the people mover and the purple line and great refurbished hotels that are ready to accept all these people. But really we just have to be here as Angelinos to welcome the world. Absolutely. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I hope you'll join me in congratulating. You can only probably hear me clap, but there's the whole crowd going wild. Jamie, Jamie, congratulations on this amazing award. You really are an angel in the city of angels. Thank you for everything that you do. And Kara, I'm gonna to toss it back to you. Thank you, LA, thank you, Asia Society, and have a great, great evening, everybody. Thank you so much for being here with me today. I really appreciate it, Mr. Mayor. You're welcome, always. Thank you so much for that insightful chat, Mayor Garcetti and Jamie. Um, as a fellow first-generation Asian-American woman, hearing about all the amazing things that you've done, Jamie, I mean, it makes me very proud that you're representing. Um, and congratulations again for being the recipient of the Urban Visionary Award this year. And also thank you to Mayor Garcetti. You are an incredible interviewer. So thank you for taking the time to do that. 
Our next honoree is the chairwoman of the Bowers Museum in Orange County. She is receiving the Art and Culture Visionary Award this year. This is Ann Shee. There's no one uh, more dedicated to a charity than, than Ann Shee. Uh, she's passionate about the Bowers. She's been with us for over 20 years. And she not only raises a great deal of money, probably more than anyone else in our history, but when we have a project, particularly at an exhibition in China, she negotiates the contract. Anne is probably the most active person I know. She is always has tremendous energy. She's always out trying to do what's good for the community. I've been trying to get a major jade exhibit out of Taipei and on three attempts failed, which wasn't unusual because we didn't know how to deal with the Asian culture. And she was introduced to me and said, is there anything I can do for you while I'm in Taiwan? And I said, jokingly, get me the jade exhibit. She came back two weeks later, said, I got you jade exhibit, now what? And that was the beginning of 20 years worth of major exhibitions. When you're with Anne, uh, everything is elevated a thousand percent. She's been an amazing force in internationalizing the Bowers. She has this ability to work with the government individuals, the people that run these places of interest, and really get them excited about telling their story in the United States. And we've done 10 major exhibitions with most of the leading cultural institutions in China. And it happens because of the personal relationships that she develops. Which really brings to Orange County a, a real perspective that they probably wouldn't get without her. With things like Mummies of the Silk Road, the Treasures of Tibet, and of course the icing on the cake is the Terracotta Warriors. Every museum in the world wants the Terracotta Warriors. We've done them twice, and in fact I'm going back to China shortly to sign a contract to do them a third time. And Anne has developed friendships with the directors, with the, the cultural agency of the province, uh, knows everyone. The work that she's done with all sorts of groups in Orange County and even outside of Orange County is really amazing. Over the years she's brought $300 from China to California. She's focused on getting the community involved and it's really been something to see. She has that kind of energy and devotion to bring all these different groups together. And Congratulations, you deserve this more than anyone I know. Anne, I'm really proud to be here and I'm really looking forward to our next trip. As you can tell from the video, Anne's list of accomplishments goes on and on and her dedication and passion are obvious to all those around her. Here to have a chat about Anne's journey, please welcome Peter Keller, president of the Bowers Museum. Kara, thank you. Kara, thank you so much. I can't believe what a pleasure it is to finally uh, do something for Anne. She is, as Ed said, the most energetic person you'll ever run into. We actually sometimes call her the uh, type A for from type A or the ever ready bunny because she never stops. But uh, as we said in the intro video, it started with an exhibit on jade that we wished to get from Taiwan. We failed three times, sent Anne, she came back, surprised me, and we got it. Um, then is the, the excitement started because as usual, things changed and was canceled. So we had to start over three months beforehand and came back with an exhibit that was three times larger. And um, I can't say enough about it. Uh, best part is, we printed a catalog. She went to a cocktail party in Taiwan to sell the catalog. She's small. She, she ran into a group of uh, businessmen, high ranking businessmen in Taipei and said, I will drink a glass of wine for every 10 catalogs you buy. And she sold 360 catalogs that night. So we don't know how she did that, but th this is all about Ann Shi. Ann? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Karen, and thank you, Peter. Yeah, Peter is like a joke with me. I've been working with 
him is over 40 years, almost 25, 25 years. About 40. 20, 25. <laughs> Anyway, what I was supposed to do was ask Anne what started her in promoting Chinese culture, because it was she did a lot before she started at the Bowers Museum. I have always been attracted to Chinese art and culture ever since I was a little girl. I remember I used to make black ink for my father so he could write a beautiful calligraphy. When I moved to the state in the late 70s, my main focus was my children, and I want to make sure they would not forget their roots. So I continue to focus on teaching Chinese culture to them. When both kids went to college, I moved my focus on passion, the love on the Chinese culture to the Bowers Museum. That is my... <laughs> and Anne, what brought you to the Bowers that day? Um, I became involved with the Bowers Museum back in the 1992. That time we just reopened in the museum. And I have to bring the Chinese education from Taiwan to Bowers. I volunteered with the fundraising and marketing in the Chinese community. I enjoyed it very much. And it was very exciting to see people who are so fascinated by Chinese education. At that moment, I truly understand how important it was to promote the Chinese culture in Orange County. That is, I start to really involve the powers from Chang Foundation's exhibition. And then the Jade exhibit from the National History Museum in Taiwan was spectacular. And that traveled across the United States to Houston and National Geographic in Washington, if I remember correctly. But then you get the bug bit you and you wanted to go to Beijing. And you were a little nervous about that. And you and Danny, your husband, were going. I had been there many times and failed many times trying to get exhibits because I didn't have the secret weapon, which was Ann Chi, which brings the charm and cultural understanding necessary to bridge these gaps. And you went to the Forbidden City. And you saw Yang Xin. And what happened? You know, you know, that is in 1995. I remember I'm from Taiwan. It's so scary to go to the mainland China and Beijing. So through your introduction, I had to, my mission, go to visit the forbidden city, Yangxin. And we are start from that time. And I, we are work together and to bring the Forbidden Cities exhibition and including the continue, we have a um, Nanjing exhibition, Shanghai Museums, Tibet, twice on terracotta soldiers, Xinjiang Chinese mummies, and Chengdu's Sanxing Dui, including the Beijing Emperor's Dowager and recently Gopi fashion collections. Of course, all on special 10 major exhibition, I would not have been able to do all of this without Peter, your support. Well, Anna, it's been a great partnership and we will continue. But one of the stories I like to remember was my first trip to Beijing, where we're meeting with, with Yang Xin, the director of the Forbidden City. I was there with Dennis Power. And between us, we had probably 40 years of museum experience. He was director of the Santa Barbara Museum and then Oakland at the time. I had been in natural history in LA and, and, and also uh, the, the Bowers, and we thought we knew what we were doing. We went in the, into the special diplomatic room to meet with Yang Xin to begin negotiations. And all of a sudden, Anne in her mink coat jumps out 
starts talking to Yangshin at a million miles a minute. And after about a half an hour, Dennis and I looked at each other and said, have you ever felt more worthless? Because we had nothing to do. Anne did it all. Remember that, Anne? Yeah, thank you. That is all you to give me a credit, you know, actually because I can use the Chinese language to communication with uh, Mr. Yangshin. That just came out to make it happen. One of the secrets in all these contracts is that we've brought over, over as we said at the introduction, over 300 Chinese scholars over the, over the years to the United States. And these are, each one of these is an opportunity for Anne to connect and make friendships. And this is a key to cultural understanding as well as diplomatic and otherwise. It's all about personal relationships and, and knowing and, and trusting your partner. And this is where Anne just excels because she has made more friends. We can go anywhere in China and uh, she'll know everyone. Uh, of course, a box of seeds helps a lot too. But uh, Anne, of all the exhibits, which was the most challenging, do you think? Well, definitely the Terry Carter soldiers in 2008 is more difficult for me. I had to bring the three museums directors together in Xi'an and to negotiate, sign the contract, and finalize that beautiful catalog. One month before the opening day, Xi'an wanted to cancel the whole exhibit. I was very disappointed when I in Beijing and also so straight. I want to thank you to Ronnie Chen, and he is the Bowers Board Trustee, Eddie Rusky's friend. Through his efforts in China, finally we were able to open on time. Thank you, you again, Ronnie and Eddie. You know, I never had a chance to thank you, two gentlemen I respect. And, and Anne, let me just fill in some of the blanks in that story. We had been in Beijing and had the exhibit canceled on numerous occasions. Uh, and we finally got it uh, that we we're, we're giving up. And we're walking down the street and going to the uh, U.S. Embassy to think they perhaps could help. And I said, let's just call Eddie Roski. He was chairman of the board of USC at the time. And they were having a board retreat. I called Ed, well, I'm sitting here with Ronnie Chen, and let's ask Ronnie if he can do something. And it was that very fortuitous phone call that changed everything. But then we got it all packed up. We were leaving on, a, it was being shipped out on a Friday afternoon. And uh, you and it was all, we sealed it up, we're ready to go. You and I went out to lunch for, to celebrate. In the middle of lunch, you get a, well, and it was the beginning of a weekend. We had UPS sponsoring the, the transport of these, bringing them back to Southern California. But they had, the Terracotta Warriors had to be out of Beijing and into Shanghai to the UPS plane by Monday. And it would happen to be the May 1st holiday. And in the middle of lunch, you got a call saying, oh, we're sorry, but customs has just shut down. They can't go out until Monday or Tuesday to, out of Beijing. And you made one of those infamous phone calls. I've never asked where they're to. But within an hour, customs had opened up again. And this was the power of Anne Chi. <laughs> yeah, I have many friends in Beijing and uh, without friends help, this connection cannot make it happen, yeah. <laughs> when the icing of the cake was the first day of that opening, we had an earthquake. I remember we had a board meeting and it wasn't good. But anyway, everything was safe. And we went on to the next exhibit. And you had uh, uh, many, many more as you dictated. And some of them were not easy. And I know your husband, Danny, has got a saying, if, uh, if uh, good things don't come easy. And, uh, and we've challenged some of the ones that were never supposed to leave, like the Silk Road mummies. Uh, and Tibet, Tibet was politically charged. Yeah. And 
you and I had to make, I think, a dozen trips to Tibet or more. Yeah. That was canceled a few times. Uh, but uh, in all your memory, the first 25 years, which was your favorite? I cannot, uh, you know, since I bought the 10 major exhibition from China through your support, each exhibit is always my favorite. I cannot pick up which one is my favorite. I love the all. <laughs> So which did you like better, the Terracotta Warriors or the okay. Yeah, of course, Terracotta Soldiers, the first one, 2008. That had a lot of unforget that uh, happened at that time, yeah. So what do you want to do next? Next. I surprised you with that one, didn't I? Yes, yeah. You know, I hope we can do the 2020 a go from China. That is, uh, we be working so long and uh, also China really support. And uh, if we can do 2022 or go from China, that is my favorite exhibition. But and we have a little time and I love you, <laughs> Ming. But you, something we haven't mentioned is all the other things you've done with China and probably the most uh, important for the younger generation is you've taken high school age, 16 year olds to work in the Shanghai Museum every summer. And you've done this, my son was involved with it, I think 20 years ago. Yeah. Uh, and you continue to do it and it changes lives. Can you tell us a little bit about your Chinese ambassadors program? Yes, you know, uh, uh, since we have the uh, uh, 2000, uh, we have a forbidden CP at the Bowers, I found the Chinese Dawson, we call the Chinese ambassador, and also I found the junior ambassador, high school kids gathering together to train in there in English to tour the exhibition. At that time, after through the training, and one of the parents come over, shake hand to me, say, and I want to thank you because my Chinese family, I tried to have a tutor and send them to Chinese school. The ch kids never agree. Always say, why I have to learn the Chinese? After I training them to tour the forbidden city, and they feel so proud. They are a Chinese and ask their parents to have the, to have the uh, tutor come to teach them the Chinese. And these kids, went to Shanghai and Nanjing with me and your son too. And through the three weeks together, they really, really learned a lot of Chinese history. I, from this program since the 2002 until today, it's already had 142 kids graduate from this program, including last year, my grandson, Ian Shi, and they all very enjoy another only being the Shanghai Museum, and also they learn a lot. And of course, they are the parents, and I'm the chaperone. So, you know, grandma chaperone, I can say yes to all our kids, and including uh, I took them to uh, Hero City to see the antique uh, store, and also give them a lot to eat. They like everything, whatever the kids require, I always make it successful for them. But besides that, I also very straight to let them learn the Chinese. So they can tour at the Shanghai Museum, at the Bronx Gallery, very well, including the Shanghai Museum's own director. They give them a certificate. They say, Shanghai Museum, beside Bowers, also your home. So the kids is very happy and we are very proud too. So that is the Virginia Ambassador Program until today we still keep training the high school kids. And Anne, thank you. That certainly changed my, my son's breath life. And I always wondered what it would be like to be in their, their school when they went back the first day of school and asked, what did you do with your summer vacation? 
and they say, oh, I was a docent in the Shanghai Museum. That's only because of Anne Shi. And you deserve this award so much. I don't know if anyone has worked as hard as you have. And it's, as I always said, it's not the years, it's the miles. And we've had many, many miles. The average exhibit took maybe 10 trips to China. So you add them up and a lot of trips yes. to China. But thank you. Congratulations. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you, Peter. Yeah. Now, uh, we, we go back. Back to Sarah. Sarah, Sarah <laughs> yours. Thank you so much for that insightful chat, Ann and Peter. Uh, what I learned basically from this chat is that you never want to underestimate a woman with a mink coat and a lot of friends because obviously she can get a lot of things done. <laughs> Congratulations again to Anne for being the recipient of the Art and Culture Visionary Award. Among Anne's talents, as Peter said, is her ability to raise money for unique exhibits and the Bowers growth. Likewise, Asia Society would like to thank the sponsors who have enabled us to offer more programs reaching wider audiences than ever before during the COVID pandemic. Tonight's gala would not have been possible without the support of our many wonderful sponsors. Next, we have some fantastic entertainment for you. Sabrina Imamura is a professional dancer, singer, actress, and all around performer. Here with her rendition of Ben E. King's Stand By Me, this is Sabrina Imamura. Hi everyone, it's really such an honor to be with you all here tonight. I hope everyone is out there staying healthy and safe. Tonight I will be singing a rendition of Benny King's Stand By Me. It's a song that always lifts me up when I hear it, so hopefully it'll lift you guys up too. What a gorgeous performance from Sabrina Imamura. I hope you all enjoyed that because I certainly did. And I am definitely counting down the days when we can go back to concerts and go back to theaters and see some live music. So that was such a treat. Here to introduce 
Our next honoree who will be receiving the International Business Visionary Award is Dick Drobnik, Chair of Asia Society Southern California and Trustee of Asia Society. Uh, th thank you very much, Carol. Uh, as Chairman of Asia Society Southern California, I am very, very pleased. And it's a great pleasure for me to introduce my friend, Dr. Stephen Riotti as our 2020 International Business Visionary. Let me provide a little bit of background and a little bit of uh, perspective on why Stephen was selected for this award. Uh, from a business point of view, Steve is the executive chairman and group chief executive officer of OUE Limited, a major publicly traded Singapore-based uh, real estate development firm. And Stephen is also a leader of Lipo Karawachi, the Indonesian-based uh, Riyadi family uh, enterprise. And Stephen is also the executive director of Hong Kong Lipo and Lipo China. So a tremendous business leader, but in addition to that, he's a philanthropist. In 2010, Stephen founded the Stephen Riotti Group of Foundations. And uh, through that group of foundations, he's funding children's education, he's funding art and music education. And uh, they, he and his family are also supporting the National University of Singapore, uh, the business school and other parts of that university. So in terms of Asia society, uh, in March of 2019, Stephen was elected to the Global Board of Trustees at our meeting in Hong Kong. And Stephen immediately said to me that, uh, how could he help with Asia Society Southern California, uh, where, where I'm the chair? And a few months later, in July of 2019, uh, Stephen and I had, uh, had a breakfast and, uh, here in Los Angeles. And he said, let's get concrete about this. What can I do? to help the mission of Asia Society Southern California. And he immediately agreed to give prime office space in the US Bank Tower on the 32nd floor to the Asia Society of Southern California, helping us in a major way. Although given the COVID lockdown, uh, we haven't been able to use it as much as we wanted to, but we started using it uh, in, in September and we expect to continue to use it in the near future as prior honoree Jamie Lee and Mayor Garcetti uh, gave us a lot of optimism about the future of LA and the future of business here. Uh, secondly, in that breakfast meeting, Stephen agreed to become a founding sponsor of a new initiative for Asia Society Southern California. It's an initiative we're calling the US Asia Real Estate Initiative, which will examine all types of aspects of real estate development in Pacific Rim cities. Um, Los Angeles, of course, but the other cities of Hong Kong and Shanghai and Melbourne and so on and so forth. And for this initiative, we have uh, some partnerships with the two major teaching and research institutions in Southern California about real estate, the USC Lusk Center for Real Estate and the UCLA Zyman Center for Real Estate. And we're really, really pleased with this. So this relationship between Stephen and Asia Society globally and Asia Society Southern California um, does come, not come out of thin air. It's part of the family tradition. Uh, Stephen's father, Mokhtar, has been su supporting Asian society since the early 1990s. In fact, Mokhtar provided prime office space for Asia Society Hong Kong Center throughout the 1990s, and Mokhtar served as a global trustee from 1997 to 2005. And, and Mokhtar, his, Stephen's father, has been a friend of mine since 1987 or 88, and we continue to appreciate what Pop Mokhtar has done for the society. And we're just delighted that Stephen is, is following suit. And Stephen recently, in fact, at the, at the March 2019 trustee meeting, presided over the opening of the Lippo Amphitheater, a, a beautiful space inside the Asia Society Hong Kong Center. So let me close by saying, Stephen and I have had personal friendship for over 20 years, and I'm very pleased to say that Stephen is a graduate of the USC Marshall School of Business, a place where I've had the honor to work for over 35 years now. So I hope that our audience, our virtual audience in 17 countries around the world will join me uh, with a round of applause for our 2020 International Business Visionary. Please welcome Dr. Stephen Riotti. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm deeply honored today to accept the ASSC International Business Visionary Award. 
I would like to thank the Asia Society, Southern California, for this recognition. I would also like to congratulate the other recipients of this year's awards, namely Ambassador Masa Haru Kono, Jamie Lee, Vivek Rana Dive, and Anne Shi on their accomplishments and contribution to the Asia Society. Since the 1980s, we have witnessed expansion of the economic activity from the Atlantic Basin to the Pacific Basin. Today, the Pacific Basin has become one of the key centers of economic activity. And much of this dynamism has been driven by the rapid economic rise of China. The role of Asia society has become even more important given the significance of US-China relations and the need for us to deepen mutual understanding and to strengthen partnership among the people, the leaders and institutions of Asia and the United States. As members of the Asia society, we have a shared responsibility to help progress mutual understanding between Asia and the US, especially with regard to racial harmony. This is particularly important now as US-China relations are very tense. Asia society has to play a greater role to create more opportunities for dialogue and engagement. I hope that all the members of Asia Society can be united in this cause so that together we can work harder and contribute to enduring peace and prosperity. I look forward to working with all of you to do our part in building bridges of peace and friendship and contribute to the stability and prosperity of Asia and the United States. Thank you, and I wish all of you good health. Uh, thank you very much, Stephen, for those, those wonderful remarks. Uh, at this point in the program, I would just like to say that the Asia Society Southern California recognizes uh, the impact of the pandemic and recognizes the terrible impact on families who've lost loved ones, on those who have fallen ill, and on the first responders who have worked so hard to protect all of us. And we've tried in our, our small way to educate Americans and Asians about the immediate impacts of the pandemic, but also the, the near-term forecast and the medium-term forecast of how the pandemic is likely to affect property markets, how it's likely to affect stock markets, how it's likely, how it is affecting public health now and in the future. And very importantly, as Stephen Riotti just said, how it's affecting racial attitudes and anti-Asian racism. And we've done a number of major virtual forums on this. In total, since the lockdown, we've done 10 virtual forums and we've attracted from 300 to 1,000 participants in each of those forums from 10 to 20 different economies around the world. We want to continue to do this, and we want to continue to, to make major efforts in this. But we've not been able to monetize these events, and we need to find a way to support, financially support Asia Society of Southern California in the future. So I hope that all of you, or many of you, will consider uh, clicking on the donate button during this, during this event tonight and help us continue to finance a great series of uh, virtual programs until we can go back into our wonderful building in the US Bank Tower. Uh, let, let me say also, I wanna thank the 25 uh, companies, institutions, and individuals who have sponsored tonight's event. It's been a tremendous help for us and it will keep us going for a long time to come, but we need continued support. So please think about uh, making a contribution to Asia Society of Southern California. Thank you. Cara, back to you. 
Thank you so much for those words, Dick. Um, it's obvious that Stephen's work and dedication have impacted so many people throughout the world. His call to action of building bridges of peace and friendship for the world resonates now more than ever. So congratulations again to Dr. Stephen Riotti for receiving the International Business Visionary Award. And to second uh, what Dick said, please consider donating to the Asia Society so that the organization can continue their great work. Um, what they were saying before about this anti-Asian sentiment and how many of these amazing virtual uh, events that they have had, these things are important, not only for us here in the US, but all over the globe. So you see the donate button on your screen and any bit helps. Next, I would like to introduce our next act. Cheryl Kay is a singer, songwriter, and a fellow actress. You may have heard her incredible music on the hit Crazy Rich Asians. Here to perform that song for you today is Cheryl Kay. We are thrilled to celebrate the honorees who have enriched Los Angeles, enhanced its global standing, and generated goodwill. Especially during this global pandemic, we should be supporting each other more than ever. So with that, will be performing Money, That's What I Want, the song that I sang for the movie Crazy Rich Asians. Take it away. The best things in life are free, but you can't give them to the birds and bees and me. That's what I want. That's what I want. That's what I want. Your love gives me such a thrill, but your love it all pay my bills. All these gold stuck to my lash And who made a cheese from being off cash All your money faker than some imitation crammy Faces on my paper always frowning I got bad war oh, money A lot of money A lot of money A lot of money That's what I want Thank you so much for that wonderful performance from Cheryl. Crazy Rich Asians was such a monumental moment for us in the film world, and it was such a treat to hear that song. Brings back great memories from when the film was released. Our next honoree is a special representative of the government of Japan for the Middle East and Europe. Executive board member of the organizing committee of the Tokyo 2020 Olympic and Paralympic Games and senior advisor to the Tomodachi Initiative. He is receiving the Bridge Building Visionary Award. This is Ambassador Masaharu Kono.
Monashi Initiative is a public-private partnership between the U.S. Embassy and the U.S. Japan Council. The vision of the Tomodachi Initiative is to inspire and empower the next generation of young Americans and young Japanese to make a difference in the world in the future. We are each different and all so much the same. And in these moments we experience and these emotions we share, we change what we can imagine together. We find what we need to go beyond what separates us. Sports is not only for athletes. そのことを忘れないようにしたいこれからも感謝と尊敬を胸に前に進んでいこうと思う東京2020プラスワン Here to introduce Ambassador Masaharu Kono is Ambassador John Roos, who served as the United States Ambassador to Japan from 2009 to 2013. He is also the founding partner of Geodesic Capital. This is Ambassador John Roos. Good evening, everyone. It is really my great honor to be here virtually to pay tribute and to honor Ambassador Kono who is obviously receiving a well-deserved honor, the 2020 Bridge Building Visionary Award. You know, I had the incredible honor of being the United States Ambassador to Japan from 2009 to 2013. Ambassador Kono truly is a visionary in U.S.-Japan relations. And we could not have had the success that we had in launching the Tomodachi Initiative, which you just saw described in that wonderful film that preceded my comments. But we could not have accomplished what we accomplished without the help and the commitment and the vision of Japanese leaders, including Ambassador Kono. So I am personally deeply indebted to what he did as a leader to make that people-to-people -people connection between our younger generation work, which is so incredibly important. If I can give you just another example uh, that was not mentioned, I believe, in the film that you just saw, but Ambassador Kono, along with Irene Hirano was very instrumental in forming and establishing the Japanese American leadership delegation that during a, my tenure in Japan and after, at least once a year, a group of Japanese American leaders came and created those connections, those incredible connections between Japanese Americans and the Japanese and the Americans in Tokyo. And I hope in our own way, we can salute him this evening and continue to build on the foundation that he has laid in bringing our two countries closer and closer together. Thank you for including me in tonight's celebration. Thank you for your lovely words, Ambassador Roos. It seems like there cannot be enough said about Ambassador Kono and the impact his work has had on the world. Here to have a chat with Ambassador Kono, please welcome Yuko Kaifu, President of Japan House, Los Angeles. Cheryl, 
what a wonderful message that we received from uh, former ambassador to Japan, uh, U.S. Ambassador um, uh, John Bruce, and um, I love the video as well. But um, uh, here we have Ambassador Masaharu Kono participating from Tokyo. Good morning, Ambassador. Um, Good morning. <laughs> well, uh, congratulations on this um, award from Major Society of Southern California, which you deserve um, more than anyone else that I know, um, because all these years as a diplomat from, of Japan, you've been doing that uh, bridge building uh, among people and um, with different countries. So um, really appreciate what you've been doing. We would have loved to have you here in Los Angeles uh, were it not for the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, we actually were planning to have you here, but uh, that would be safe for the future opportunity, for future opportunities. But uh, um, I I'd like to ask you a few, few questions. Uh, you've done so much and it's very hard to cover everything that you've done. But we, I like to start our conversation from the days then you were here as a Consul General of Japan in Los Angeles in 2001 through 2003. You were here for two years. Um, you came here, uh, posted here in May 2001, and then came 9-11. Uh, and uh, you were very busy addressing this huge issue of terrorism and uh, uh, protecting the safety of people. Uh, but at the same time, you were very popular among people in the community, and um, you attended uh, many, many, many events and programs, small and large. You are an avid, um, uh, beautiful singer, and you are excellent uh, single player of golf. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, would you like to um, share with us a few things uh, going back to the days, 20 years ago, actually? Yeah, thank you very much, Yuko. Um, well, first and foremost, I'd like to say I'm very much honored to be awarded uh, on the, this uh, Asia Society things. I appreciate that very much. Secondly, I'd like to express my sympathy to the Californians for facing a very difficult time for mountain fire and, and so on. And again, I'd like to say hello to my good old friend, Japanese Americans who uh, happen to be watching this video. I, I'd like to say hello to them. Well, back to 20 years ago, 2001, I was there as a council general. And um, one of my very important mission is to uh, continue communicating with the Japanese American community here in Los Angeles or Southern California. Um, Yuko was very popular among, uh, among them, I knew that, but uh, I'm also, together with Yuko, I was very popular and uh, I did a very good communication with the older generation people and young generation people of the Japanese Americans. One thing which I witnessed was that uh, as generations go down, their interest in Japan is weakening, or I like to say that uh, a kind of an indifference uh, on Japan by the younger generation Japanese Americans uh, was uh, rather tremendous. I was, so I have a little bit of concern that as generation goes down, then those Japanese Americans uh, will be disconnected from, from Japan or the Japanese society. Although there, well, th that is one big concern. And secondly, as Yuko mentioned that um, half a year after my arrival in LA, September 11 happened, September 11. Well, um, my concern, second concern was after, in the aftermath of September 11, I also witnessed there's a certain kind of prejudice against Asian Americans, Asian Pacific Americans, including Japanese Americans. And Japanese Americans were in a very difficult position. Well, those are the kind of naive opener for me. So in the autumn of 2011, I started a exchange program between the young generation of Japanese Americans and good, good young Japanese. That was uh, this project, project pro program uh, we started, initiated. 
Well, we have no political agenda behind it. But one thing which I like to see is that uh, for those Japanese Americans, young generations, I hope that they can, they can find their own roots in Japan. So the only, and also a, uh, to try to make, build a network uh, between young generation between across the Pacific, Japan and the United States. And that was uh, somewhat successful and networking was built and both Japanese and both Japanese Americans and Japanese uh, made friends with each other. That may, I'm uh, hoping that that to broaden the, a, the horizons of uh, Japanese Americans for the future. That is, uh, well, th that is what I did. Many interesting episodes. For example, one Japanese Americans went to Japan for the first time and so met with their remote relatives there and they, they, they found out their roots. They went to the graveyard and see the, and then burst into tears to see that this is my root. That kind of emotional experience and personal experience by each Japanese Americans was very important for the future. That's, well, this is a chat, so I don't want to make it a one-sided chat, <laughs> so I will stop it here, Yuko. Thank you, uh, Ambassador. Um, as a matter of fact, for those of you who don't know me, I, I was with the foreign ministry at that time, and I was uh, um, called in here uh, to, to work for uh, Consul General Kono. So I arrived here um, in September, two weeks after 9-11. So um, one thing that uh, I, uh, to, I, I did do uh, was uh, to work on this creation of Japanese American leadership delegation. Because of the war experiences, many Japanese Americans, like second, third, fourth generations, as um, Ambassador Kono just said, had uh, uh, some um, distance between themselves and Japan. And, and we thought that it's a pity if we did not um, connect them or reconnect them again with, with Japan. It would be a missed opportunity. That was when uh, the, the right timing because uh, Ambassador Kono, uh, Consul General Kono was there and visionary leaders of Japanese Americans like um, Irene Hirano, you know, uh, um, at that time, Irene Hirano and the late Senator Inoue um, they got together with uh, Consul General Kono and worked on the creation of this. Uh, uh, Ambassador, you said uh, young Japanese American leaders. Uh, it was supposed to be young Sansei or the third generation Japanese American leaders. But as the, the years progressed, uh, it has been like 20, almost 20 delegations. And uh, they were not necessarily young they were not necessarily third generation. So that, that's how we renamed it as Japanese American Leadership Delegation, but the impact was really, really great. Um, do you, would you like to elaborate on, on some of the achievements? Yeah. That's right, that's uh, our lifespan yeah. is expanding and uh, longevity is that we are facing. I'm older generation, of course I say that, but I'm in my early 70s, but maybe I may have still another decades to go. So well, this, as Yuko said, that this uh, cluster of uh, participants on this uh, program was uh, is, uh, very, very important. I think I can, we can count more than 2,200 Japanese, young Japanese Americans participated in this program. Now we call this program JARD, Japan American Leadership Delegation. Is that, is that what, you, what you say? So right. this is amazing. You know, Yuko, one thing uh, I have, if I have one hidden agenda on this project is, uh, of course, my view is toward the Japanese Americans also, but at the same time, I, I'm a bit concerned about the uh, Japanese themselves they have been losing their interest in the Japanese Americans. They are losing contact with the Japanese Americans. But if you look at the history of uh, uh, Japan-US relationship, Japanese Americans have been playing a very important role, particularly after the Second World War. 
Those are the group of people who are kind enough to facilitate Japanese business circle to come into the United States for doing business. So we owe a lot to a, the Japanese Americans then, and including the Tokyo Olympic game 1964, uh, like uh, Fred Wada and some other Japanese uh, leaders here in Los Angeles played a very important role for the promotion of a uh, Tokyo Olympic uh, 1964. So we shouldn't forget about it. And uh, we would like to, this project exchange program is a very golden opportunity for the Japanese to be enlightened by the achievement and, uh, and the role to be played by the Japanese Americans. That is uh, one, very important hidden agenda, not only for the Japanese Americans, but for the Japanese, next generation Japanese. You're, you're very right, uh, Ambassador. Um, at that, that time, uh, things have been changing over the years. Uh, as a matter of fact, as you said, there have been more than 200, uh, 217 uh, Japanese American leaders who were invited to Japan so far, and uh, next year, 2021, celebrate the 20th. Um, anniversary of the launch right. delegation. Yeah. So, but then at that time, many Japanese Americans were told by their parents and grandparents not to be, uh, they did not have to speak the language, the Japanese language. They did not have to go to Japan because uh, they ought to be active in the mainstream America. But uh, uh, it's, uh, the, the delegation trips uh, gave an opportunity to Japanese people to get to know about Japanese American. Uh, contributions and uh, the friendship that they could feel instantaneously. And also it was instrumental in forming the friendship among Japanese Americans. So when you started the delegation trip, it was uh, uh, limited to California, California right. those people in California, but then it's been expanded to cover the entire nation. Uh, and uh, it formed a camaraderie, the friendship among those Japanese Americans. So it's- yeah, I would like to say thanks to Yuko. You expanded those activities, starting from the tiny bit of a group of people in Los Angeles, go, then go to San Francisco, California, and all of the nations, including Hawaii. Right, so uh, that was really a significant contribution that you made, uh, made such a great difference as a, a bridge builder and a lot of people uh, remember uh, you for uh, your contribution and, and foreign, uh, former Foreign Minister Taro Kono was also instrumental in growing this uh, delegation trip uh, the program. Now then uh, your term here wasn't uh, really long, just for two years or so you were missed but you had to be called back to Tokyo to um, possess important uh, positions there at the headquarters of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs like um, Deputy Minister uh, for Foreign Affairs, which is like the one of the most sen senior most uh, positions. And then you were posted to uh, Russia and Italy as ambassadors. And when you were um, on your uh, duties um, as ambassadors in uh, 2011, of course, in, on March 11, uh, the um, great earthquake hit the uh, northeast part of, of Japan. Um, and um, so that was a disastrous experience that all Japanese had. And immediately uh, the um, US military and uh, Japanese defense forces uh, joined hands and worked together on operations Tomodachi to provide immediate uh, relief to the devastated area of Tohoku, as we call it, the northern part of Japan. And uh, that confirmed the close relationship and friendship between Japan and the United States. And based upon the spirit of friendship and collaboration, this uh, Tomodachi initiative was launched as a private uh, public partnership. And Tomodachi, as for the sake of the audience, that uh, means friendship. So based upon the spirit of friendship and collaboration between the two countries, this uh, Tomodachi initiative was launched uh, at this time to make an investment, invest in the future generation, future um, leaders of Japanese and Americans. And there have been thousands of young students, uh, both from both countries who've been benefited uh, from this program. And all along, when you return to Japan, 
um, you, you have been the senior advisor for the initiative from the Japanese government because the Japanese government has been supporting the initiative. And you've, been, you've met with uh, many uh, Japanese and Americans participants. Would you like to share some thoughts and impression that you've had? My point is one day, that all what I'd like to say was already token by Yuko. Sorry. Uh, I have nothing much to add, but uh, of course, um, well, that was a disaster, natural disaster, earthquake and tsunami 2011. And then uh, such a difficult time, um, tremendous amount of uh, rescue operation being offered by all over the world, including the United States. But on top of it, what the United States took uh, immediate initiative was this uh, Tomodachi initiative. I would like to take advantage of this occasion to a thanks uh, Ambassador Roos. Uh, he was uh, he was uh, he he took initiative. This is partnership between among public private uh, partnership and also the. USJC, that is the United States Japan Council, was a very important organ to promote this initiative. And uh, as you already mentioned, that the central figure of promoting this uh, initiative was uh, Irene Hirano. Irene Hirano, in no way, she passed away this year. That was a sad moment for all of us. But thanks to their effort, this uh, Tomodachi initiative has been growing and growing. And networking, again, I like to use the word networking and friendship between those two people. And on this project, um, this is bandwagon was joined by government sector, business circle, and civil society together. And uh, a kind of a huge movement is uh, continuing between Japan and the United States for flow of Japanese, inflow and outflow of Japanese to the United States and vice versa. So uh, um, I, I feel that there is a resonance with what Yukon and I did 20 years ago and what, what um, this Tomodachi initiative was initiated 10 years ago, and that is still going on. That is a very important aspect and component of if you look at the relationship between the two people across the Pacific. Well, thank you, indeed. And, and at this time, it's not just the Japanese Americans, but it uh, includes um, right. broader uh, uh, Americans. Um, and uh, so, I think that many there are many young people who are indebted to uh, this program and um, your instrument you you are um, ambassador Kono you're always visionary but you're always funny and down to the earth so whenever you meet with a group of those uh, young students they love you too <laughs> thank you thank you very much. So it's, it's not a <laughs> <laughs> That's a good connotation, I hope. <laughs> no, it's, uh, I, I really mean it. So um, currently, uh, you are, of course, the government representative and special envoy for the Middle East Peace, and uh, you are senior advisor for the Tomodachi Initiative, and you are a member of the executive board of Tokyo 2020 uh, Olympic and Paralympic Games, which is huge. Everybody in the world actually, is um, holding his, her breath to, um, to, to be anxious that the announcement would be made uh, with the confirmation of, of happening it, although it was postponed unfortunately because of the pandemic till next year, and it still be called 20, Tokyo 2020. But uh, would, would you like to share some thought of, about where you are, uh, where, where Japan is in terms of the Tokyo 2020? Yeah, this is a coincidence, but uh, 20 years ago, there was a terrorism attack. 10 years ago, there is a uh, natural disaster hit Japan. And now, almost 10 years after, we are facing a very serious pandemic threat. Uh, under such circumstances, uh, we are supposed to host a Tokyo 2020 this year, but uh, we did the unprecedented decision uh, together with IOC to postpone it for one year. This is a, so we are facing a very un, 
an unprecedented challenge. Uh, but under such circumstances, we are, uh, what we are doing right now is that uh, we set up a new we, uh, task force to launch and uh, to make this 2020 plus one happen next year. We are working around the clock. Committee members is composed of 6,000 plus people. They are dead serious about doing it, working around the clock for the preparation. There are three important principles after we face the coronavirus. Uh, three principles. The first one is a safety first. Safety to be secured for athletes, stakeholders, spectators, staffs, and, and volunteers, and so on. And second principle is try to minimize the cost, minimize the additional cost, because this is the man, taxpayers' money, we have to save it. And in order to make those safety and minimizing the fund happen, what we are working, endeavoring right now is to, how can I say, simplify the program as a whole, simplify the games, and organize the event itself more efficiently than we have expected. We are taking already actions, full-scale review of uh, comprehensive measures, precautionary measures, and also emergency measures. Uh, we are this, this, this uh, preparation and operation is underway. So um, hoping that, uh, of, course, uh, of course, the nature of the Olympic may become a bit different, but the most important principle is athlete first. And uh, we would like to take measures of uh, immigration control, for example, a medical, uh, inspection and retreat, um, treatment measures and systems and venue management, well, social distance and blah, blah, blah. And safety measures for the athlete village and, well, transportation and others. This is a gigantic project, gigantic work to be done. But uh, those are the things. One thing I would like to emphasize that we are dead serious. We will do it. Mm -hmm. So that's very good to hear. That's uh, very good to, to uh, know. Um, and also the changes and adjustments that you'll be making uh, would not be just for, uh, to, in order to address the COVID-19 um, pandemic or the after, uh, after, after the mask, uh, but, um, but also it could provide some answers to the future Olympic Games. You said that economizing or making it simpler might be might provide some answers to uh, for the future Olympic Games or any international uh, sports matches uh, games like that. So I think that we really appreciate what you've been doing. Uh, we the Japanese likes festival, like uh, Californians too. We love it. So we before the pandemic happened, uh, we consider we 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 thought that uh, this Tokyo 2020 will be the biggest sport extravaganza. There are many different kinds of ideas floating around and spending a lot of money for that. But uh, well, we have to change the mind, make it minimizing and simplifying those other things. But one thing for sure, which I would like to share with you is the power of sport. Sport has a power and work together as one for the Olympic and Paralympic Games. Then this will be the springboard for the future. And uh, this is the investment for the future generations. This is, uh, and also to support the economy and improve health, happiness, and respect diversity. Those are the values, and those are the values which are, we would like to maintain and we share it. So, uh, well, we need hope. And we need hope, and we need a uh, uh, to to make 2020 20 plus one a symbol of unity and solidarity among the people. Again, back to my original theme: networking and friendship. That is a key word to make Olympic Games be success. Well, Am I a bit too serious about this issue? 
that well, is what I feel. Well, thank you so much. And, and uh, we could go on forever. <laughs> could uh, probably go on for another hour or so. But uh, in respect of the time, uh, I'm glad that we can, you, you can finish your remarks with a positive tone um, towards the Olympic Games. Uh, we will make this Olympic be a success and to pave the way to a, uh, the Olympic 2028 in Los Angeles. Well, probably our experience, our, our experience will be a very good food for thought for the preparation for the uh, your Olympic in 2028. That's what I would like to add. And thank you so much, Yuko. And I have, as always, I'm enjoying conversation with you. Uh, thank you, uh, Ambassador Kono. It's been an honor. And uh, let me turn it back to Kara. Thank you. Thank you so much for that chat, Yuko and Ambassador Kono. It is incredible to hear about all the work uh, you've both done with connecting Japan and the U.S. Uh, through the Young Leaders Program and the Tomodachi Initiative. And um, I'm sure Yuko speaks for the entire world when she says we are all very excited uh, to get back to, you know, whatever normal is. And uh, Ambassador Kono, I think you called it uh, Japan 2020 plus one, which I love that. So we are all very much looking forward to that. Congratulations again for receiving the Bridge Building Visionary Award this year. 2020 has been a difficult year for all of us throughout the globe. Earlier this year, the world suffered a terrible blow as it lost one of the most recognized athletes in the world. He was also honored by Asia Society Southern California in 2009 as a cultural ambassador. Regarded as one of the greatest basketball players of all time, he was considered the beating heart of Los Angeles, Kobe Bryant. as a basketball player, as a businessman, and a storyteller, and as a father. You ever have a sense of love for him and the way that he can bring out the best in you? Looking at how he responded and reacted with the people that he actually loved. I think everybody should your lifetime when they have the ability to help others. You have to be able to do that. You know, it's much bigger than us, it's bigger than ourselves. You, know, you can't just go out there and play basketball and score a lot of points and do all this other stuff. You, know, you have to be able to use that in a positive way. The cultural melting pot that is America, the diversity that is America. There are kids all over the world that, you know, that need our support, that need our help. And uh, it's very important for us to do something about it. In terms of opening up doors or, you know, for you know, Chinese basketball players to come into the NBA and for their youth here in China to believe that it's possible to achieve the dream of being an NBA player. I mean, all that started from Yao. Kobe and I always maintain a deep respect and a love for one another. You said yourself that everything negative, pressure, challenges, it's all an opportunity for me to rise. Dear basketball. Thank you guys so much. I love you. Mamba out. Kobe Bryant was not only known as an exceptional basketball player, but a philanthropist, a filmmaker, and an amazing father. I think I speak for Asia Society and for the world when I say, we will miss you. Our next honoree is the owner and chairman of the Sacramento Kings and founder and former CEO of Tibco Software. Receiving the Game Changing Visionary Award, this is Vivek Ranadive. I was born in Bombay, India. I grew up in a uh, beautiful house that was right uh, by the beach, it was Juhu Beach, right from an early age it was instilled that you always had to be the best at anything you did, and you always had to live a life that was bigger than yourself. My years at MIT were among the most productive years of my life. 
I showed up there at age 17 with $50 in my pocket and big ideas and big dreams. I was known as Mr. Real Time because I was the first person who actually pioneered the use of real time software. First fell in love with basketball when I coached my daughter Anjali's basketball team. And so I came up with a math equation for the game. They ended up executing on the math equation. We ended up winning all the games uh, and taking the team to the national championship. I just fell in love with the game. I had been a corner of the Golden State Warriors for a couple of years and was the vice chairman. We got booed and then we started winning. Uh, there was a story that emerged out of Sacramento that a group uh, led by Steve Ballmer in Seattle had a deal to buy the team and they were going to move the team to Seattle. It is not an exaggeration to say he saved the Kings for Sacramento. This looks like an arena. Yes, it's here. It's here. The vet is always thinking about the next great revolution in America. Vivek worked with NBA Commissioner Adam Silver and Pacers owner Herb Simon to create the 2019 NBA India Games, the first NBA Games ever played in his home country. You know, I had this vision, you know, we could take this sport and we could make it a global sport. But I think what Vivek really wanted to do was use basketball as a sport uh, to both, you know, contribute to uh, the California Sacramento community, but also to bring this world together. I believe that for myself, my best days are ahead of me. I'm still trying to figure out what I'm going to do when I grow up, but hopefully over the next 10 or 20 years, I'll have some answers. Incredible to see all the amazing things Vivek has already done in life, and I'm sure there is even more to come. Here to introduce Vivek and his many accomplishments is another man who needs no introduction. This is Shaquille O'Neal. Congratulations, Vivek, on receiving the Change in the Game Visionary Honor from the Ageless Society of Southern California. A well-deserved recognition for a true renaissance man. I'd like to tell people that Vivek and I became especially good friends because we share so many things in common. First, we are both proud fathers. We are both competitive. We both speak out for social justice. And interestingly, we both began our careers in a similar way. Vivek started out in this country with only $50 in his pocket. And I started out in the NBA with only a 50% free throw average. And of course, today, we now both work considerably more than $50. But curiously, my free throw percentage is still around 50. Vivek and I clicked immediately, especially when I found out that Vivek has more nicknames than I do. Vivek has been known as the Big Dreamer, Mr. Real Time, Big Software, the Indian Baller, and even Big Savior after he stepped in to purchase the Kings for Sacramento. In all seriousness, Vivek, I salute you for the great accomplishments, for your big heart to try to make the world better. You're truly an inspiration, a role model, and yes, a game changer to us all. I'd like to close now by repeating the Hindi words that Vivek chanted when the Kings went to India. J-Ho was translated, Victory B. So J-Ho, my brother, J-Ho. <laughs> Here to explore more of Vivek's journey, is chairman and CEO of Mandalay Entertainment Group, which produced The Last Dance, this year's epic documentary on Michael Jordan. A fellow NBA team owner, he is co-executive chairman of the Golden State Warriors. Please welcome Peter Goober. Hi, and thank you. I'm glad to be able to support my friend Vivek, who I've known for almost a full decade. And, you know, really one of the thoughts that I had is, now, what was that moment as a young boy, a young Bombay boy who didn't grow up playing basketball that said, maybe I can own an NBA team? Where was that seminal element, Vivek, that made you think about doing that? So, Peter, I have uh, you and Joe to thank for that. 
because uh, you guys gave me the opportunity to be part of this uh, great fraternity. Uh, but it all actually started, the whole dream started for me in Bombay. Uh, when you get to be older, you look back at your life and you say, was there a defining moment, a point that made you who you were? Uh, and for me, it happened when I was a little boy in Bombay uh, and I had my ear plastered to a little transistor radio. Uh, and I heard these magical words, one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. And of course, I was listening to the Voice of America broadcast the moon landing live all the way to Bombay. And I thought to myself, wow, who are these people that were able to take a man, put him in a box and propel him 250,000 miles away to land on a rock flawlessly the very first time? What brilliance, what ingenuity, what courage. Uh, and I said, you know what, I want to be one of them. Uh, I, I want to somehow get to America. Uh, so I took my uh, study seriously. I studied science and technology, uh, applied to MIT. Uh, they obviously made a mistake in the admissions process. Uh, and I ended up uh, on the shores of Boston with uh, $50 in my pocket. Uh, and that's where my journey started. Uh, but I've been very fortunate throughout my life, Peter. So you and Joe gave me a chance to be a part of this fraternity. Uh, MIT accepted me. And of course, now uh, the Asia Society is giving me this honor. So thank you uh, to uh, uh, Charlie. Thank you to Josette. Thank you to all the folks do the, that do this incredible work with the Asian Society. Uh, this is incredibly humbling. Uh, and I'm in great company. And I don't deserve to be there. Uh, but namaste and thank you for the opportunity. You, you made history as the first American first Indian American to own an NBA team. And then again, by taking the Kings to, uh, to India for the NBA's first preseason games in India. H tell me about that moment that you were there in India. I mean, that's got to be very formative for you, that there you were back with the team in India. What were you, what's your dream and aspiration for India and the NBA? Yeah, so Peter, you can imagine what this must have felt like for me. You know, I left the country uh, I left uh, Santa Cruz Airport in Bombay uh, as a 17-year-old. And then uh, one day I, I show up uh, on a plane uh, and my players and, and my colleagues, you know, we get out and you see these massive billboards as you drive into the city and they're welcoming us. They're welcoming the NBA. Uh, I grew up playing cricket. Uh, I left India with nothing. Uh, and so now all of a sudden, the entire city is plastered with pictures of our players. Uh, it's plastered with welcome signs. Uh, the gateway of India, which is the gateway to Bombay, uh, this iconic site, uh, there's videos playing there, uh, showing the game, showing our players, showing uh, uh, famous uh, NBA legends. Uh, and then, Finally, it's, it's, it's game time, or, or for you, show time. Uh, and uh, I'm sitting there courtside. There's a who's who of people, uh, of Indians in the crowd, actors, celebrities, politicians, comedians, uh, my family, my family's there. This is my hometown, my hometown of Bombay. Uh, and uh, this game that I've fallen in love with, uh, Two NBA teams are going to play a real preseason game there. The ball goes up in the air, uh, the game starts, uh, and it, it's the moment of a lifetime. So take that another step further. Look at China. You're familiar with the fact that uh, Yao Ming came out of China and, and changed the, the, the nature of how we look at Chinese uh, uh, players, and, and the audience was big there. What do you see for... Uh, growing the NBA in India and really finding players in India, which are local players that can be part of the NBA or the World Basketball Association. Well, Indians, they, they love sports. Uh, they love to celebrate. Um, they love all kinds of cultural activities. Uh, and basketball to me is more than a sport. Uh, I'm friends with kind of the Brad Pitt of India. Uh, his father uh, is, uh, is famous, Amitabh Bachchan. His son is Abhishek Bachchan, also an actor. 
Uh, and he told me that when he saw basketball, he fell in love with it because it represented more than a game. It had a swagger to it. It had a vibe to it. And this is what Indians love. So while in basketball will never surpass cricket as the national pastime, uh, I see it really as being a strong number two. Uh, it, it's already one of the fastest growing sports in the country. Uh, there's uh, literally 100 million people that have been watching this sport over the last few years. Uh, the numbers are staggering. Uh, and uh, I fully expect that it will become one of the largest markets uh, for the NBA. Uh, I also fully expect that over time, uh, like within the next 10 years, there will be players uh, from India, players of Indian origin uh, that make their work way into the NBA. So you're a location-based uh, entrepreneur. In other words, you're in the butts and seats of fans and stands business like us, you know, like, like and, you know, it's, it's really, you know, a, a powerful interruption that's happened, you know, and the idea of the revenue from not having, or the lost revenue of not having fans in the stands and whatever collateral revenue you may lose is not good. Uh, what do you take from that shutdown? How long can the, the business sustain itself without putting fans in the stands because of the COVID pandemic? Yeah, so of, of course it's, you know, it's been tragic, uh, COVID's been tragic and there's been uh, many uh, uh, people that have uh, died uh, and uh, it's had a, a terrible economic impact. Uh, but what it's also done in some ways is that it's catapulted us into the future. And so it's taken us into 2023. So if you want to know what the future looks like, uh, just go outside because this is, this is the future. Uh, and it's accelerated many of the trends. And so after all, even before COVID, uh, less than 1% of people actually viewed the game in the arena. Most of them were seeing it on some kind of a screen. Uh, and we've actually had to innovate uh, in terms of how do we make it even more interesting uh, for those people that are not in the arena. Of course, uh, Peter, we both own arenas and so we want uh, fans to come back. Uh, there will be more and more advanced testing techniques. Uh, we're experimenting with breathalyzers where you blow into a tube and within 10 seconds you get a result. Uh, there's saliva tests. Uh, you know, there's a vaccine, on, uh, multiple vaccines on the horizon. Uh, our arena is also completely contactless so that you can actually walk in and if you opt in, it recognizes you. Uh, everything is contactless. You can be in your suite and you can pour a drink and the sensor in the bottle tells you exactly how much you poured. So again, there's very little human contact. So we were doing this anyways to eliminate friction uh, from, uh, from the uh, fan experience, uh, and that will continue. Uh, so in, in my mind, uh, we will have uh, fans uh, back and we'll actually have them uh, in, in the next season. You know, maybe not at full capacity, uh, but I, I do fully expect that at the end of the day, Peter, you and I know that really this is the communal fireplace. Uh, in, in the old days, you built cathedrals, you built uh, town squares. That's where people gathered. You don't do that anymore. So this is the cathedral of the future. The, this is where people come to, to celebrate, uh, to worship, uh, to, to connect with other people. Uh, and that's what makes us human. Uh, so fans will be back. Uh, and I believe that technology will prevail. Uh, and it's our job to make it safe, to make it secure, uh, and to make it even better than it was before. Do you have any vision of the, some of the elements of technology that will be, will be transcendent, that will, that will emerge, not necessarily this week or this year or next year, but over the next few years that will, will bring the sport another whole element, both of revenue and of fan engagement? Yeah, I believe that you know, we're already experimenting with these contact lenses, which give you uh, a 3D augmented uh, view. So you can look at uh, the a game from, from any, any position, any angle. Uh, you can look at replays. You can uh, look at the ball uh, in, in flight. Uh, we're already looking at how to make that experience uh, available to everyone, not just somebody uh, who's, uh, who's sitting on the floor uh, people are finding more and more ways uh, to connect. 
uh, where, uh, of course, uh, looking at ways that you can have even more data. So uh, if you can wear uh, uh, straps and instruments that uh, give you information. Uh, and then, of course, there's the whole game on top of the game, which will be even bigger than the game itself. Uh, so now that uh, people are starting to state by state uh, legalize uh, sports betting, uh, that'll be an avenue of, of new opportunity as well. Uh, so I believe, Peter, that uh, uh, from a business point of view, you know, this is a, is a great investment. Uh, and uh, I, I, in, in 10 years, will I still use my iPhone? I don't know. But will I still watch the Kings and the Warriors? For sure. Well, beyond business, you know, beyond your business success, you've always aspired to make a difference in the world. You rescued the Kings from efforts to abandon Sacramento when you committed to the betterment of California's capital city. You've also spoken up in support of minorities and fellow immigrants seeking equal treatment and opportunities in the U.S. Explain your concept of Civilization 3.0 and how you can, within, within and probably outside of the NBA, work to advance social justice and unify people at what's really a critical juncture. Yeah, so Peter, I believe we're entering a new era. So Civilization 1.0 was kind of the start of modern civilization. It was driven by the agrarian revolution. Uh, people were farmers, shopkeepers, carpenters. It was the age of the artisan and the raw material was land. Uh, with the industrial revolution, it was 2.0 and it went from being uh, the age of the uh, artisan to the age of the corporation. Uh, the raw materials were energy and steel and it was all about efficiency. Uh, we're now entering an era where the world's largest bookseller has no bookstores, the world's largest taxi company has no cars, the world's largest hotel has no real estate. So it's really the age of information and service. Now, when the world went from one to two, there was massive, massive disruption, and only 7% of the one jobs were there in two So as we go from two to three there's going to be even bigger disruption, and, and perhaps the greatest wealth creation opportunity in human history, because the raw materials now are data and even imagination. Now, if you think about what were the skills that people had, you know, you were plowing the fields and you were using your muscles in 1.0. In 2.0, it was all about optimizing and efficiency, uh, and it was kind of your brain. Mm -hmm. 3.0 becomes the age of empathy, and so it's really about the heart and how you connect with people, uh, how you empathize, uh, and it's about what you can do. And Peter, you and I have always shared this philosophy that it's bigger than basketball. Uh, and so this sport uh, gives us tremendous opportunity. It's a huge privilege, but with that privilege comes responsibility. Uh, and it's not enough just to be thinking about profit. We also have to think about purpose and we have to think about how do we make the planet better and how do we actually impact people's lives. Uh, and we've shared that philosophy that, yes, we all want to build a winning franchise, but then it's also important to impact uh, the lives of those we touch in a positive way and, and make the world a better place. I thank you very, very much for sharing your book, your philosophy and your heart. You really are a very authentic human being. Your feet, tongue, heart and wallet all go the same direction, which is unique in this world. And I wish you great success in your continued journey, both with the Sacramento Kings, but not against the Warriors, but, but, but in the world and in basketball and in Asia and America. So thanks for letting me converse with you. Well, thank you. No more state all. Thank you. Thank you for that thoughtful and entertaining discussion uh, between Vivek and Peter. Um, it was really interesting to listen to some of this new technology that, you know, I'm sure is always being developed, but to hear about this you know, concept of civilization 3.0. So uh, very, very insightful <laughs> to probably what is going to be happening in the future very soon. So congratulations again to Vivek Ranadive for receiving the Game Changing Visionary Award this year. And congratulations to all of our honorees this evening. Your passion and work to continually bring Asia and the rest of the world together is an inspiration to us all. It is a privilege for Asia society to honor these extraordinary leaders whose contributions have made Los Angeles, the city that it is, and the world the place that it is. Here to close out the evening is the Executive Director of Asia Society Southern California, 
Charlie Coker. Kara, thanks so much. And uh, uh, I wanted to echo your eloquent words of thanking all the honorees and the moderators for um, amazing and inspirational um, words this evening. Um, we are very grateful um, for your participation and for the privilege of honoring you for your amazing work in the world today. Um, we'd also like to thank our donors for supporting us and uh, for making this program possible. Um, in, in the same vein, I'd also like to thank the gala committee headed up by Brian Triger, our vice chair, for his amazing work and the amazing work of all the members of the, of the committee, including, including co-chair Michael Riotti. Um, without you, this, none of this would be, have been possible. Um, I'd also like to thank my Asia Society Southern California team for their amazing work and tireless um, effort, uh, and, and plus the many others who have helped us um, to make this program possible. I'd also like to make a final appeal um, to, for you to consider joining um, as a member. Please, you can press on the button above or to make a donation to support the programming that we're doing to build bridges, to, uh, to get information out, to um, let people know what's going on in the world, in the global world that we live in today. And hopefully you will support us um, in our mission. Um, finally, um, I'd like to um, introduce the final act of the evening tonight, um, Karen Han, who is a virtuoso Arhu player, a ethnically Chinese folk instrument, who's been featured on many, many films, including Mulan, the most recent Mulan film that was just released. So without further ado, I give you Karen Han. Good evening, everyone. My name is Karen Han. Tonight, I would like to play Dynamic Dreams, which is composed by my husband, Paul Alderson, and I. I hope you enjoy, and thank you so much for inviting me to join this wonderful event. <laughs> 